over 3,000 kids live in Montreal. Like 4,000? Four. Four. Uh, then so I'm it's even thinking. more than I thought. The follow up is uh, we have a lot of uh, carport things. Yes. I mean, it's just a natural reality, uh, you know, when you talk about what kind of crimes exist and are happening. And, and uh, they're usually uh, uh, something of opportunity. I mean, uh, when they do it, and, uh, uh, and obviously the reality is uh, down here at the Tenderloin, as well as Chinatown, we're the lowest income neighborhoods in the whole city. And uh, so the people obviously that come here to visit or whatever, uh, always looking for quick um, money. Um, and of course then the other one is panhandling, uh, which we see a lot of them. I, I don't get why people decide to panhandle when if the people living here don't have any money. <laughs> Well, and that I, part I can't. And I, I really don't answer. understand it. Every block you go down, somebody's asking you for money, and sometimes they're really aggressive. Uh, and they're especially at the BART stations, uh, and in front of always in front of the Walgreens. You walk in front of any Walgreens, you'll see them uh, <coughs> hanging out in front of the uh, Walgreens, aggressively panhandling, uh, um, and sometimes even having a response. And I sometimes, um, when I'm walking out of the Walgreens, I say, "What well, you see?" Here on the are actual pennies on the sidewalk, but they want something bigger than a penny, um, and uh, and but they'll pick it up. But eventually, but they might even noticing the pennies on the sidewalk in front of them. They want something more talent, talentable out of you. Well, the aggressive panhandling is not something that I would be dealing with, unless it's a particular individual that's a particular nuisance. But that would be something I think more for SFP. It's not something that would necessarily be charged that it would get to me. If it was, it would most likely be a misdemeanor. It would have to rise to the level where it's becoming a robbery, where the person's actually using force to intimidate the person and giving the money out. So that's where it would come across my desk. But um, the auto bird issue, though, I can't address. And um, I know that Southern has abatement teams for um, the auto birds that are fantastic. I just did an auto bird trial a few months ago, and the defendant got three years state prison for his first auto bird conviction. And that same judge, I got the next trial I had was a um, assault with a deadly weapon. It's a strike under the three strikes law. She gave him no jail time and sent him to a program. And then he just hit somebody over the head with a wine bottle and stabbed him at six and working. So I think that there, the difference between those two sentences from that same judge, you get three years for an auto bird, nothing for Assault with a deadly weapon. It's there was an article in the Chronicle blaming judges for the auto bird problem, saying that the sentences are too lax, and because nothing happens to people when they come to SF if they do an auto bird, that it, it basically there's a people come from out of county to commit those crimes here for that reason. Now I've had multiple cases, and this is again it's just fantastic work by SFPD because they document it. They um, and I had a case out in the sunset where a guy had broken into multiple cars and he didn't even get anything. He was just smashing windows, looking through the cars, not seeing something, wanting it, breaking the window and taking it. So these are people who had nothing in their cars, but now they got a smashed window, even though they had nothing in their car. They couldn't, you just can't win when someone's that willing just to break a window for no reason. But he found a bag of potato chips and he was eating the bag of potato chips as he's walking down the street, smashing windows, going into the cars. So he gets arrested for breaking into the vehicles and he has to be cited out, which is basically just be written a ticket and not be taken to jail. And so the officer said, no, we're taking you to jail. And the guy mouthed off and said, essentially, well, I'll be out before your shift is over. He's like, and he said specifically, in San Francisco, I'll be out before you're, before you're off work. And so the officer wrote that in the report, said, you know, when I arrested him, this is what he said. Um, Judge Moscone, the same one that would not sign the stay away order for that person at the hotel, it's the 16th admission. When he heard that, that he was bragging about the fact that he came to San Francisco to commit crime, set his bail at a quarter million dollars for the uh, auto work. And so having someone who's specifically victimizing San Franciscans, if somebody is coming here specifically to commit crime, all those things are important, and it kind of will change a judge's mind and change your perception of what's happening. But again, those are if SFPD documents that like they did in those cases, then the DAs that are in court can then convey that to the judge. Um, Judge Wiley is another example. He's a guy that was boosting stuff from Stonestown and was bragging on the bus that he goes into Stonestown, comes up from South County, rides the bus up, shoplifts there because if he gets arrested, nothing will happen to him. And so when he was arrested, uh, one of the witnesses on the bus came forward and said, hey, he was bragging about the fact that he came here to shoplift. 
And Judge Wiley said his bail is over $100,000. And so he was in custody for over a year waiting for his case to go forward. Um, had he not said those things, he probably would have just been cited out or his bail would have been set at a minimal amount and he would have been back stealing again the next day. So one of the ways to interrupt that is to have enough information to show the judge that they're making the wrong decision. But in order to be able to do that, um, you know, I need more information. So to the extent that anyone wants to help, that's great. So my next question, which I think is very important, is that this was marketed to the standard some time ago, which was the community courts. Yes. And uh, you, uh, when I talk to the police and there's an issue that's going on, whatever it happens to be, they say, well, first of all, many of the people can't afford a pot, so they're not going to get a ticket. So they're, so what are the options? So how can they get you pursued to the point there? There has to be a penalty for if everybody else can uh, be a law-abiding citizen but these, there are people that act out in this neighborhood and you know, they either come to this neighborhood or they act out once they're here. Uh, and um, they're, they feel there's no consequence. And uh, there should be a consequence because that's the only way you change people's behavior by saying, hey, uh, you are, there's gonna be a consequence. You know, whether it's a fine, that they feel there's not gonna be a fine because they can't afford it, so that they're finding an agency that'll uh, get them off the hook on that. But then there should be community courts. Uh, and and there, uh, there has to be some way to get back to the community for what they've done. Um, is that being utilized or not? It is, and it, in my opinion, it is effective in certain circumstances, but only with the appropriate cases. And I'll give you an example. If you have somebody who's committed you know, multiple robberies and they've been to state prison, if they didn't commit a vandalism and you have them go to community court where they have to face the person who's, who they've harmed, it's not going to have much of an effect, if any. Um, community courts are very effective at people without a criminal history who then who have committed a crime, they've injured somebody either you know, financially or by doing property damage, having to then be in front of that person and hear from them what effect they've had on them, that can have a deterrent effect. But as far as uh, if it's an actual like a felonious uh, offense, I don't know that the community courts are as effective. I don't think that's true because I know a couple of people that have got in trouble have history in the point of community court. I guess at that time of their life, they decided that it was time for them to straighten up. So you never know where a person may be at. So I, I don't find that part true, what you're saying. You know, people with the no, no, I'm not saying it's 100% true. Oh. I'm just saying. Overall, I mean, it, it is kind of putting people in like different categories. So, like, for instance, a violent robbery where mm -hmm. somebody's on their phone, somebody walks up, punches them, and takes their phone. That would not be an appropriate no, case for community. No, no, no. Yeah, we've understand that. Yeah. Even, like I said, it was marketed to this neighborhood as a way to address and, and, and unclog the, the legal system, and as an alternative. Uh, and of course, there's all these other kind of courts that I don't know if they still exist, but. Kind of yeah, absolutely. So there's a whole host of alternative courts. And the other thing before we move on is the there's a difference with the quality of life in, in, um, issues, which would be infractions like urinating in public or things like that. If somebody is homeless and they get a quality of life infraction, um, the penalty is they have to accept 20 hours of services. So essentially the thought behind it is that they're not if they're living their life in a way that's negatively impacting other people in the community, they have to accept services as their penalty. So they're not fined. The consequence is, is that they have to accept services. And I've worked in the traffic court negotiating dispositions with people about how many hours. They either go to Glide, or they go to other places, they bring in their sign-in sheets, and it gives them some accountability, and then also they talk to the judge. Yeah. Well, that, and, and that's great, but I think, uh, I think I think y'all should look at a, uh, a, a different way than just the same nonprofits being the people being sent to because um, you get comfortable, and when you get comfortable, you know, as the artists go to fly and, and, and just move around for a little bit and have them sign my paper, um, I, I think it should be some other services. There. The way it works is there's a list, and then the judge who's there talks to the person who's been cited, uh -huh. and then asks them, like, what's going on? What's going on with you? What's happening? And then, like, here are things that are available, and they actually work with them. Well, I think it should be, what part is, 
what part of San Francisco do you live in? Or what part of San Francisco do you paint in? And then this is where we're putting you. So it won't be an option for them to say, well, I'm, I'm going to go to Glide, and you have 50 people going to Glide, and all these other nonprofits that they need to go on going. I can, I can absolutely let the person who's running the, because right now it's uh, essentially either lost, basically law students or yeah. running the traffic court. I'll go and talk to the DA that's supervising them, yeah. and I'll, I'll definitely bring up that suggestion. I think it's a good one. Um, now, the other the alternative courts that you brought up, there's Behavioral Health Court, which is fantastic. Uh, there's uh, CJC. So what, what's its jurisdiction? What can it do? What can it do? So in order to be eligible for Behavioral Health Court, you have to have an Access 1 diagnosis. So you have to be both diagnostically appropriate and amenable. And so what happens is uh, when someone's arraigned for a crime, if the defense attorney who speaks to them thinks that they might have a mental health issue or that mental health issue might be driving their criminal behavior, then the uh, attorney will ask for what's called a 4011.6 for BHC purposes, and then jail psychiatric services meets with the person. They'll then also review their medical records. And, and if they have an access one diagnosis that, that BHC can help with, behavioral health work can help with, then they talk to them and say, do you want our help? Do you want to work with BHC? So if the defendant wants to work with BHC and they're diagnostically appropriate, the case will then go up to BHC. And then there'll be, uh, and I'll give you a real world example, because one of the cases I had that went to BHC, uh, was a young man, he's on, I think it was on the 14, the, uh, he was off his medication and had a psychotic break. Uh, when a bus came to a stop, he picked up an elderly gentleman and threw him off the bus. And the guy cracked his head on the pavement and uh, had a head injury, some stitches. But he was okay, no permanent injuries, but hit his head pretty good. Um, at arraignment, the defendant was in tears. He was saying he was off his medication. He was felt terrible about what he had done. It was, I think, the second or third time that he had gone off his medication and had psychotic episodes and assaulted people. So the, the, the victim, the person who was injured by him, wanted him to go to BHC. Um, I believed it was appropriate to go to BHC, but my office was not comfortable with that until he did some programming. So he actually stayed in custody for a while, but he was working with jail psych, he was getting on medication, he was stabilized, he was doing well. And then finally we agreed, yes, he should go to BHC. And the disposition that he got was is that he was gonna plead guilty to the assault on the person that he assaulted. But if he complies with BHC, uh, accepts the services that he gets, and doesn't reoffend and doesn't pick up any new cases, then the case will be dismissed like it never happened. He won't have a conviction on his record. And so it's a really good deal for him. It stops somebody whose uh, criminal behavior is caused by a mental illness from being stigmatized with being a felon. He had no prior felony convictions. And so it's a way for him to you know, kind of get himself back on track. And so that's like a good example of BHC working. And he did well. He did really well when he was in BHC. He worked with his case managers. He was on his meds and everything was fine. So that's what BHC is for. And that's kind of what it's geared toward. Um, there's also CJC, which is, of course, this is part of the CJC catchment area, um, and that's a separate court. There's also a drug court for people that whose crimes might be motivated by um, drug addiction, and there's young adult court for people under 24. Um, what else is there? I think that's about it for the alternative courts. And then there's also intensive supervision for specific cases that might benefit from somebody getting additional services. And that's great because in intensive supervision, they check in a few times a week, and there's services available to them, including housing for people. So, that's what we do. Um, any other questions from anybody? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, could I? Sorry. Um, um, the trash situation, because it's like every morning, I live on Turk at 124 uh, Turk. Every morning, there's, there's trash by the Helen Hotel, right? And um, do y'all do anything about that? that? Have you had any cases three about one maybe? I have three one one is the key. Call three one. No, one I know one. that, but that's no. that. Yeah. Do you do anything in the prosecution wise? Yeah. Arresting people. For going? Yeah, because it has to be some cameras. Be because every day is the same place. It's, it's the same place. That's all. I'm just curious. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, but also call nine. Call three one one. Even if it's there all the time, and you think someone else might have, because it also keeps a record of it. Yeah, so unless it comes from another block, it, 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 it doesn't just come from my block. People bring it. Call nine. Call three one one every time it happens, because if it's documented, it keeps happening. Okay. And that way, the 
Yeah, you can track it. So that'd be a good thing to do. Okay. All right. There. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 that uh, we're going to go over while we do this. Um, I also have some stickers up here if folks uh, would like stickers. that um, I work on projects, letting like people know um, about projects that exist, and um, also uh, I come to community meetings like this and you know, serve as a resource for community groups and interested folks to find out a little bit more what's going on. I can get you uh, a packet in a second, uh, Michael. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of different things on the agenda, um, and so I'm going to kind of go um, uh, I'm going to start with the BRT projects, um, both Gary B BRT and Van Ness BRT, uh, which we uh, call the Van Ness Improvement Project and the Geary uh, Rapid Project. Um, so I'm going to start with those. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, three streets um, that are uh, kind of all, or well, three projects that are kind of all connected. Um, in the Eddy Street uh, traffic calming project, um, the Taylor Street uh, project, um, then uh, the Sixth Street project, and then Turk um, to finish up. So uh, this is going to be a you know the kind of uh, information I've got is um, you know there's some depth to it, but this is mostly an overview um, because you know there was a, a request for a lot of projects, and if we had brought you know, the project teams from each and every one of these projects here, um, we wouldn't be going home until sometime tomorrow morning. Um, so, uh, you know, this is intended to be a catch you up, kind of give you um, a wide berth of information. And if there are more specific questions, um, we can schedule uh, project teams to come to additional meetings um, in the future. Many of these projects are in, you know, all of these projects are in different stages, and because of that, that means that they're in different stages of community outreach and, um, and, and, and working with the community. So in many of these um, projects, there will be additional opportunities um, for you to get involved, have your voice be heard um, if you have opinions on the project. Um, so with that, I'm just going to uh, you know, sit down because I've got a lot of notes and a lot of paper and uh, start if you guys don't mind. So the first project that I wanted to talk to you guys about um, is probably the biggest project, um, which is the Van S Improvement Project. Uh, you have, uh, I just passed out, uh, the last, uh, you know, very flight attendant um, uh, the last uh, neighborhood bulletin uh, that went out, uh, which talks about, um, you know, uh, small business, uh, ways that we're trying to work with small business. Um, and uh, how to survive construction, um, uh, things that we're uh, encouraging folks to do, 
uh, talking a little bit about um, how to visit the corridor when you're, um, you know, during this process uh, of